So we're going live on uh, Facebook. As you see, I've uh, I've shared a video with you guys. It's a one minute video. I'll show that video. I will uh, give a brief introduction and then uh, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Rowland about uh, the French Mountain, uh, Frenchman Mountain, excuse me, and the uh, Rainbow Gardens. This is our Paiute ancestral land. This is where our people hunted, gathered, told stories. To think that any part of the Desert National Wildlife Refuge would be shut off to me, to my people, to anyone, would be an absolute tragedy. We are identified by the lands from which we came. We have to keep on protecting them. All right, uh, short and uh, to the point. Uh, that was uh, Fawn Douglas, uh, and the uh, video was from a documentary called Exquisite Wasteland uh, by Backcountry Pictures. Uh, what they did is they helped us uh, kind of kick off this campaign, um, getting information out there about the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, currently, um, we are awaiting a conference. Uh, so we could figure out uh, exactly how um, uh, the Desert National Wildlife Refuge will be affected um, from the legislation that will be inside the NDAA. So I'll go ahead and stop this share. And um, Dr. Steve, you can begin your share. Uh, while you're getting your share up, what I'll do is I'll uh, start with a brief introduction. Uh, we are uh, Friends of Nevada Wilderness. Uh, I'm Shailene Campbell, and um, this is the Wild Speaker Series. Uh, as far as our organization, uh, the Friends of Nevada Wilderness, we're a statewide nonprofit uh, dedicated to the wild spaces of Nevada. So uh, we are wilderness advocates, and we get our work done uh, through uh, three avenues, uh, educational outreach, stewardship, uh, and also advocacy. So I'll begin with the advocacy. Um, uh, we are wilderness advocates uh, and defenders of public lands uh, around the state. Uh, so one project we've been working on uh, is the um, Desert National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I'll share uh, the Don't Bomb the Bighorn um, uh, dot org uh, website with you here in the chat, and I'll also post that uh, on Facebook for you guys. Uh, stop by, uh, read what's going on. Uh, also, once you sign the petition, there are other avenues for you to get involved. Uh, we have tweets directed at uh, the Nevada delegation uh, and also tweets uh, driving awareness of the uh, petition. So um, that's our advocacy side. Uh, stewardship, uh, we do uh, complete projects uh, all across the state on the ground. Uh, with volunteers. We've been limiting our contact uh, with volunteers due to the uh, uh, pandemic, uh, but we are still out on the ground. Uh, we have uh, paid uh, trail crews in northern Nevada. Our southern Nevada team has been working on uh, Griffith Peak Trail, uh, and we'll be continuing that, uh, so you can check that out on our website uh, and look at our calendar of events. Uh, and then finally, educational outreach, which is why we're here tonight. So. Uh, we like to make a platform uh, for uh, local scientists, activists, um, to uh, be able to uh, convey uh, the projects that they're working on, sometimes research. Uh, so tonight, uh, we're here uh, to listen to Dr. Uh, Steve Rollins gonna tell us about uh, this amazing area uh, to the east of uh, the Las Vegas Valley um, and what they're doing uh, to try to get this place uh, protected. So. Thank you, Dr. Steve, and uh, you can take it away. Okay, thank you, Shailen. This is my first Zoom talk. So I, first of all, wanna thank Shailen for walking me through the, the procedure here, and it hopefully things will go well. So I'm wearing two hats tonight, one as the president of Citizens for Active Management, which is a group that's existed for more than a quarter of a century uh, to work with collaborative, collaboratively with the BLM on management issues out on the east side of Las Vegas Valley, area that is 
largely been neglected over the years, and also as an emeritus professor of geology at UNLV. So the talk is going to be a combination of geology and land management issues. So just first of all, to, to get the geography right, I think probably most of you know what Frenchman Mountain is, but as, as you probably know, a lot of people in the valley don't. Uh, so Frenchman Mountain is the, is the main mountain mass over on the east side of town. Um, here's a, a air, aerial view showing Frenchman Mountain. There is a Sunrise Mountain that many people confuse uh, with Frenchman Mountain. Sunrise Mountain, of course, is a, is a somewhat smaller peak on the north side of Lake Mead Boulevard, uh, off to the east of Nellis Air Force Base. And then Rainbow Gardens is the beautiful area to the east of Frenchman Mountain. So that's the area that I'll be talking about this evening, Frenchman Mountain and Rainbow, Rainbow Gardens especially. Here's a satellite image courtesy of Google Earth. Uh, so we'll get, we'll get back to looking at some of the details of that. Frenchman Mountain is a, is a spectacular stratigraphic section in geologic terms. In a few minutes, I'll talk a little more specifically about the, the geology of it. Um, first, first I'll, I'll focus on the Great Unconformity, which is the famous, the more famous high profile aspect uh, feature at Frenchman Mountain. So you can see there the French, the Great Unconformity is this, we're looking south in this view, so it's on the west side. Um, the Great Unconformity uh, is, a, is a phenomenon or an interface between Precambrian granite and schist, metamorphic and igneous rocks, and the sedimentary rocks of, of the main mountain mass. This, this figure was originally drawn more than 25 years ago by a draftsman, very talented draftsman in our department named Nate Stout. This was the, the, the you are here block there and was designed to tell people who are stopping at the Great Unconformity interpretive site where they are uh, relative to the overall uh, geography. So a li little bit about what an unconformity is. Uh, an unconformity is a buried erosion surface. It's a place where rocks have been eroded, usually above sea level, and then sedimentary rocks were deposited on that erosion surface. So it's, a, it's just simply a buried erosion surface. So this, this uh, sketch just shows a simple example of the granite and schist that occur below the Great Unconformity at Frenchman Mountain. And then sea level, th those rocks were exposed, eroded, and then sea level rose and covered that erosion surface with sandstone and then later other sediments. And so the Great Unconformity is that interface between those very old rocks and the relatively younger rocks that overlie them. It's, it's a, it's the, the age between, the age difference between these two bodies of rocks is a hu huge in this case. Um, here's a photograph of the Great Unconformity itself. There's the sandstone above that's called the Tapit Sandstone. That name will come up again a, a few times tonight. And then the rocks below are the granite and schist um, of the, what's called the Vishnu group. And that yellow line is the, is the interface between those. So that's the, the so-called Great Unconformity. It's especially prominent and visible and accessible here at the base of Frenchman Mountain. It's more famous, I suppose, at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So a lot of people who study geology and want to see it uh, spend, uh, spend at least a day hiking down to the, to the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon to see the Great Unconformity um, and then hike back out. Frankly, the exposure at Frenchman Mountain is much better than it is on the Bright Angel Trail in Grand Canyon. So this is really a better place to see it. There are a few other places uh, in the west where, where the Great Unconformity is exposed, but nowhere as, as well as at Frenchman Mountain. Here's the view from, from Lake Mead Boulevard looking south. So that black line now is the Great Unconformity. These, I'm, I'm on an uh, on a, on a, a Apple computer and it doesn't like my labeling here. So I'll just skip through that. But the, the, the Vishnu schist on the right is 1.7 billion 
The sandstones on the left are half a billion years old. So there's 1.2 billion years of time represented by that interface. So that's why it's called the Great Unconformity. There are lots and lots of unconformities in the rock record. This one just happens to be the most famous and it's one that represents a huge interval of geologic time. And then in the bottom panel, you can see that the Great Unconformity is tilted quite steeply as are the rocks that overlie it, the, the layered sedimentary rocks of Frenchman Mountain. That brick pattern represents carbonate rocks, limestones, and dola stones. And then the, under, the underlying rocks there are sandstones. So that's, that's the tilted nature of it. And I'll explain in a few minutes why, why it's tilted. Here, here's a similar view in the Grand Canyon from a geology textbook that shows uh, Shailen, can I point, can I use my my cursor to point things out or not? I it doesn't seem to be doing anything, so I guess I can't I guess I can't point to anything. I'll just have to describe it. So you can see there the tapete sandstone is that yellowish unit overlying the Vishnu schist in, in the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon, and and that's overlain by Bright Angel Shale. And the the, the trilobites over on the left margin. Uh, represent time intervals. So the trilobites are, are species of arthropods. I'll show a picture of one in a minute, a real picture. Uh, and they represent real timelines when the trilobites first appear and when they become extinct. So we can tell by that that the, the tapete sandstone, for example, that sandstone that, that lies at the foot of French for Mountain is what we say, what we call time transgressive. That is the the bottom and top of the tapete sandstone is not the same exact age at French for Mountain as it is in the Grand Canyon. It's a little older at French for Mountain because it took the sea a, a, a couple, three or four or five million years to transgress across the edge of the, of the North American continent uh, from French for Mountain into the e eastern margin of the Grand Canyon. So why are the layers at French from Mountain tilted compared to those in the Grand Canyon, which are nearly horizontal? And so that's another story uh, of, the, of the geology of the Grand Canyon that has to do with the tectonic history of Southern Nevada. And to put it in simple terms, um, back more than 15 million years ago, Frenchman Mountain was, in fact, the rocks that are now exposed in Frenchman Mountain were horizontal, just like in the Grand Canyon. But during that interval, what we call the Miocene epoch, Western North America became stretched due to interactions of, of plates, giant crust, crustal plates out in the Pacific Ocean. And that, that interaction translated into the interior of the continent in such a way that that the blocks were pulled, pulled westward. So this, this is a, 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 a before faulting view showing the future French from Mountain. And then here's one that shows the blocks starting to slide. And there's a major, major master fault at depth, some depth below French from Mountain. And those, those types of faults are called detachment faults. And then there are secondary faults. And these faults are all curved like a snow shovel. And so as, as the blocks of rock slide westward toward the right, down that curved fault, they tend to rotate back toward the left or back toward the east. And so if that continues long enough, as it did in this case during the Miocene epoch, uh, we end up with French Front Mountain having moved something close to 50 miles from its original position. This cartoon doesn't do justice to how far it's moved. So it's moved tens of miles to the west from its original position. And so you can see in the left part of the lower panel, the Grand Canyon where the, the rocks are still horizontally bedded, flat-lying horizontal rocks, which flows out into Lake Mead. And then all the blocks of rock in Lake Mead have been tilted back toward the east due to movement on these curved faults. So that that's in a, in a brief explanation why the, the, the strata at French from Mountain are tilted so steeply. And that, I lost that, that, that image does not like this uh, Apple computer, so we'll just move on. Um, 
So our group, the Citizens for Active Management, or CAM, first formed in the early 1990s and developed a, had a formal collaborative relationship with the Bureau of Land Management to develop an interpretive site at the Great Unconformity. And we did that. We got some federal trail grant money to pay for interpretive panels and we worked closely with BLM staff and, and made a, a beautiful interpretive site at right at the, at the Great Unconformity. This is the, the day that that site was, was uh, dedicated, February 17th of 1995. The speaker there is Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt. I'd say, uh, uh, I think it's not too much to say. He's sort of a legendary uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Interior rather. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, some Boy Scouts in the back and, and others. So that was, that was a wonderful day. Here I am 25 years ago. Um, motioning about something to do with geology probably and behind me was Senator Richard Bryan, Senator Harry Reid was there in addition to of course a lot of other local uh, dignitaries. So it was a it was a wonderful day. You can see uh, Senator Reid has his hand on the stone panel uh, built on a on a nice platform cinder block platform. The stone panel was 24 by 48 inches made of a black granitic rock called diorite from India that was imported uh, from India for the, the craftsman who etched the, the, the diagram. And it's the same diagram I showed you, that cross-section Frenchman Mountain along with the, the text. So it was a really a wonderful day and we all were very proud and, and happy. Um, here's my, my good friend Nick Sains in the straw hat and me. Uh, enjoying the, the, the pristine monument. And here are two other key people in that process, former Senator, former State Senator Tom Hickey and Helen Mortensen. Now, Helen Mortensen and I are still, still actively working on, the, on CAM issues. And at the dedication, there were llamas involved, and I'll explain briefly why the llamas in just a, just a minute. So it was, a, it was quite a day. Uh, we had, in addition to the the interpretive panel right next to Lake Mead Boulevard. We had a smaller one across the wash about 100 yards away um, that specifically addressed the geology of the Great Unconformity. Uh, and then a couple years later, we put up a, an interpretive trail, a interpretive trail that went up the, up the mountain, the, the small mountain right behind the Great Unconformity. This is one of our trail signs already, already uh, uh, damaged by graffiti a little bit here, but not too badly. Um, and at the very top of the hill, we put in another interpretive panel on a big steel monument. We were unable, because the area at that time was a wilderness study area, that wilderness study area status has since uh, been removed, but at the time it was a wilderness study area, so we were not allowed to use any power equipment, uh, such as uh, little motorcycles or anything to get this, this stuff to the top of the hill. So we used, uh, we used young lads who were doing a community service um, as, as required by court order. Um, and these guys were great. I mean, they were very enthusiastic and very helpful. And we, we put this big steel monument way up on top of the little hill there, a beautiful site overlooking the valley. And this was a, uh, an interpretive panel that interpreted the geologic history of Southern Nevada. So that was, that was a wonderful activity in the early, in the late 90s, 95 through the end of the, of the century, and it all went bad. Well, here's, sorry, I'll get to the bad part in a second. Here's, here's uh, the dedication of that, of that other monument. Boy Scouts were involved. Um, and so here's, here's uh, some of the bad news. Um, vandalism just was, was uncontrollable. So these, these stone, stone panels were, were destroyed at the top of the hill. The one that Harry Reid's got his hand on here was destroyed at the bottom of the hill. Um, and finally, the, we, we tried to, working with BLM, BLM law enforcement, uh, tried to manage the vandalism and it just became unmanageable. BLM finally just pulled it out and basically gave up, said, okay, it was a good try. Uh, we didn't work, uh, you know, that's, that's the end of that. Uh, the, 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 the trail signs, some of which are still, some of the little, mont, the little posts that held them up are still up there on the trail, but the signs are, are long gone. 
So, so that's the great unconformity story. And I want to get back to the management issues at the end of my talk. But before I do that, I want to talk about some more geology. Uh, and there's a lot more to the Frenchman Mountain area and Sunrise and uh, Rainbow Gardens area than the Great Unconformity. It's a wonderful feature and it's a great teaching opportunity to talk to people about geologic time and, and rocks. There's sedimentary rocks and igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks there. So it's the kind of place the Great Unconformity is where you can take Cub Scouts and tell them basic geology, teach them basic issues of geology, uh, about different kinds of rocks, or you can take graduate seminars in, in isotope geochemistry and talk about isotope geochemistry there. So it's, it's a wonderful site with one, a wide spectrum of, of educational opportunities. Um, the, the, the Frenchman Mountain is the most complete, well-exposed, easily accessible stratigraphic record of Earth history on the entire planet. That's gonna sound uh, hyperbolic. It is not hyperbolic. It includes two of the Geological Society of America's most significant geologic sites in North America. Uh, several years ago, the GSA in, polled their members and asked for nominations for the 100 most significant geologic sites on the continent of North America. Two of those sites are in the Frenchman Mountain Rainbow Gardens block, and I'll briefly mention what those are as I, as I go along. It's an extraordinarily important stratigraphic section. Uh, and, and, and here's just a brief summary of, of that in the same drawing uh, that I showed before. Uh, so it begins with, with the Precambrian rocks, the, the granite and schist representing kind of the ancient world and then the first of the, of the sedimentary rocks, the tapete sandstone, the ones that, that's lying directly on top of the Precambrian basement rocks, um, is, represents the beginning. It, it contains the beginning of shelly animals. So the Cambrian explosion, as many of you know, is the time when life just blossomed uh, on Earth. And the, and the Cambrian rocks in the Grand Canyon capture that. So it's, it captures the beginning of complex multicellular life, the first shelly animals, and continues on from the right to the left to the, the presence of the first land plants and the first amphibians and first reptiles. The first dinosaurs finally appear way over on the left-hand margin late in the Triassic period up in the Moenkopi formation. So there's nowhere on earth, literally nowhere on earth, where this spectacular record of, se of sedimentology, of, of the stratigraphy of the earth is so well represented and so accessible for people to come and, and see it. At the Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon is wonderful. I, lo I love the Grand Canyon, um, but we have a much more complete section here. Not only are all of these formations thicker than they are in the Grand Canyon, so there's, there's, there's more detail there, but also in the Grand Canyon, the top of the the Grand Canyon is at the Kaibab Formation. So if you look on the left of the, of the diagram there, you'll see the Kaibab. Everything above the Kaibab has been eroded away from the Colorado Plateau at the Grand Canyon. Here at the Frenchman Rainbow Gardens area, we have another thick section of Mesozoic rocks, that is the Triassic and the, the Jurassic. Um, no Cretaceous, but we have, we have um, sedimentary rocks representing the next period uh, on top of that. I, I, I won't bore you with all of the stratigraphic details, but just to emphasize, it's an extraordinarily thick record of, of the history of life and the history of, of Earth. And there's just nothing else in the world that can compete with the stratigraphy present in, at Frenchman Mountain. Um, in addition to that, just some of the other features that are present within this general region. There's a, a wonderful trilobite fossil collecting site. Here's, here's a, a group of folks I was with a few years ago. It was an international paleontological field conference. Many of these folks are from China, um, and as well as many as from Europe and, and other, uh, from South America. So this was a big international section, uh, field trip that, of folks that specialized in Cambrian stratigraphy. And they were just delighted to come to the, the famous French from Mountain section and, and look for trilobites. And they found some, this is, the, this is the tail portion of a trilobite. 
Um, this is this is a diagram, not from French Vermont necessarily, but this is a diagram of an Olanellus trilobite. Olanellus is that that lowermost zone of trilobites in the Cambrian. It's the lowest. It's the lowest zone of trilobites. These are the oldest trilobites uh, in North America, and those are the ones that occur directly above the tapete sandstone in the Bright Angel Shale at at French Mountain. Trilobites were arthropods that became extinct in the Permian period. Uh, they swam around in the in the sediment and, and uh, ate organic material that they could find. So there's that. Um, it has one of the most famous archaeological sites in North America, Gypsum Cave. I, I could spend this whole talk uh, talking about the wonderful archaeology and paleontology of Gypsum Cave. Uh, one of my master students um, did, a, did her master's thesis on the vertebrate fossils from Gypsum Cave just a, a few years ago. So it's a, it's a really interesting story. It was excavated in 1930 by um, Mark Harrington. Uh, and it, it became it became one of the most important and and famous geologic uh, archaeological sites in the world. I, that's all I have time just to say about it. But it's a it's a really important site also within this Rainbow Gardens Frenchman Mountain block. Um, fascinating geology in Rainbow Gardens. Again, I don't have time to do really do justice to it. Here's an aerial shot of Lava Butte, for example in Rainbow Gardens. Lava Butte, as you can see in this purple color, is a, is a lacolith. A lacolith is, is like a volcano, like the, the root of a volcano that spread laterally, as you can see there. So even though it's called Lava Butte, it, it really isn't lava. There was a volcano there at one time, but the volcano, the actual lava that flowed out on the Earth's surface has long since eroded away. Uh, and what's left is the, 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 the the erosion resistant root that's exposed now at what is called Lava Butte. So there's a lot of interesting uh, geologic history there. Um, we use at UNLV, we use Rainbow Gardens often as a teaching outdoor laboratory when we're, when we're allowed to take students in the field. Uh, and you can see from the wonderful exposed rocks there um, that, is, that it is a, a phenomenal place. Here's a place, for example, where there's a, there's a very interesting fault uh, that, that students can students learn how to identify faults in the field and on aerial photographs and satellite images. So you can see that that dark brownish ridge in the upper part of the photograph, for example, um, is offset with the, the right hand side having moved toward us and the left hand side having moved away from us relative to the other. So uh, it's just it's just wonderful geology out in Rainbow Gardens again spectacular exposure. Uh, we get those of us who study geology out in the West, especially in the Southwest, get spoiled by the exposures where we can see all the rocks. Geologists in the East, where the rocks are covered by vegetation, just, just uh, are blown away when they come out West and they, and they actually see these kinds of features. Here is uh, Lake Las Vegas, which is at the southern end of Rainbow Gardens area and the river mountains beyond. We're looking south here. So, so there's great geology in Rainbow Gardens. And it's also in terms of recreation opportunities, there's excellent cool season hiking trails that range from short and easy to long and strenuous. The kind of the classic uh, hiking experience at, at Frenchman Mountain is shown by, it's a little bit to the left of this, the center of this picture. Uh, you can see the, the dashed line there that goes up uh, it's a it's an actual uh, access road um, for some of the communication equipment up at the top of the mountain. So there's a it's actually a road. It's a very gravelly road. It's a four and a half mile round trip from the from the trailhead at Lake Mead Boulevard and about an 1,800 foot change in altitude. So it's a steep route. Geologically, I would say it's boring uh, because it it stays in one in one stratigraphic interval. So you're not crossing from one layer to another. It's much more fun for me to hike up from uh, just, just east of the, of the, the Mormon temple uh, at the east end of Bonanza. There's, there's a network of trails that, that wander up Frenchman Mountain. So that's when I'm hiking on Frenchman Mountain, I'm usually over behind the, the temple hiking up that way. 
and, and I can go through layer after layer after layer. There's, by the way, a formation called the Frenchman Mountain Dolostone, uh, which my grad student and I named, uh, that's, that's exposed there in the Cambrian. So that's where we, that's where we uh, have, ex have described and measured the thickness of that. Um, in terms of hiking opportunities, this is just some of my, some of my uh, undergrads at UNLV on a geology field trip hiking around the Frenchman Mountain Block. This is a hike that, that my friend Nick Sains led on a, as a Sierra Club hike on, on January 1st. He typically does a January 1st hike in Rainbow Gardens. Here's Nick describing or pointing out some volcanic rocks. And we hiked up to the, the Red Needle and Thumb Pinnacle, which are two of the more, more spectacular and, and scenic features in Rainbow Gardens. Here's aerial view of Red Needle and the Thumb Pinnacle. By, by the way, I should mention at this point that the, the second of the most important geologic features uh, on the continent that occur in the Rainbow Gardens French Mountain Block. The first one is the stratigraphy of French Mountain itself. The second one is the rocks that form the, the, the top of the Red Needle and the Pinnacle uh, and, and also occur elsewhere in Rainbow Gardens. These are conglomerates that, that, that whose origin is way over at Gold Butte, which is like 40 miles away. It's a, it's a complicated story that I won't take the time to tell, but it, it, it tells the whole story of the pulling apart, the extension of, of this area that's connected with the rotation and tilting of the Frenchman Mountain strata that I mentioned earlier. So those are the two features that were, that were uh, celebrated by the Geological Society of America a few years ago as two of the most significant geologic features uh, on the North American continent. Um, there's excellent potential. That I, the, the hikes that I've mentioned, such as the one that goes up that uh, access road uh, all over on the, the north side of the mountain and the hikes, the trails that I've hiked over um, east, east of the Mormon Temple, none of them have, have uh, trailheads, formal trailheads with any kind of signage. Uh, they're just so social trails, really, that people have done. Uh, some, in some cases, remarkably so, that some of the trails over uh, behind the Mormon temple uh, are, are remarkably well constructed. They're steep. They don't conform to uh, National Park Service gradient standards, um, but they're, they're perfectly functional trails for people that are in, in pretty good shape. Um, so there's excellent potential, not only for hiking, but also for mountain biking trails, a paved bike path to, to Lake Mead across the, across the pass, I think would be wonderfully popular, equestrian trails, covered picnic areas, a campground, none of that is there. there there's certainly potential, there's, there's trails that, are, that have been developed by local people mostly, um, but there's, other than some interpretive signage which has been vandalized, and I'll mention a bit more in a, in a few minutes, um, there's nothing in the way of improved recreation uh, guidance. Um, the, the area is managed, it's all Bureau land management. Um, it has, uh, it's managed as a sunrise management area with portions of it defined as an ACEC. ACEC is a, is a BLM internal term standing for area of critical environmental concern. So it's certainly recognized that there are some environmental issues there that need to be att attended to and the BLM has identified those. Here are the signs, I would, I, this, this, these pictures, this one and the next, I took just yesterday morning. Um, my colleague at BLM, uh, Amanda Royal, who might be watching the, the presentation tonight, um, alerted me that the BLM has put up some, some signs. There's no interpretive message on them yet, but the, they're beautiful um, signs right next to the Great Unconformity. There's a close up. So very soon, Amanda and her, her colleagues will be putting up some, uh, some interpretive signage on these panels to uh, tell people, again, 25 years later, um, what we tried to tell them uh, in the original interpretive site. So I wanna get into the management issues that, that CAM has in mind. We've, as I've mentioned, um, CAM has been working 
on this intermittently for 20, more than 25 years now, but a quarter of a century. And, and we're frustrated. Uh, we were frustrated because our original uh, interpretive site was, was destroyed uh, and uh, couldn't, be, couldn't be protected. And so we think that it's time for a higher level of, of, of management and intensity out in that region. Um, and, I'll, and I'll go through some of the reasons uh, I think that's the case. And so we're proposing um, a, a national recreation area be declared, uh, be defined for, for the Great Unconformity Rainbow Gardens areas. So it would have higher, st higher status, more funding, higher law enforcement um, presence, and more, more users who are respectful of the land. Um, so just to put it again, take the geography, here's the Clark County wetlands. So, so our proposed national conservation, national recreation area is north of the wetlands to the west of Lake Mead National Recreation Area. Of course, not including Crabco Gypsum south of, of Nellis and not including the landfill. So basically the area in the middle of the, of the image there is the area that we are suggesting would be a wonderful National Recreation Area with, with, with wonderful potential for outdoor recreation and education. So why is this area need to be protected as if, as if I didn't already make a strong enough case? There's a huge demand for outdoor recreation in Southern Nevada. As we all know, during the cooler months, Red Rock Canyon is just loved to death. Um, on, on, a, on especially weekend days when the weather is nice, um, the scenic drive has to be closed because uh, the, the, the volume of cars just is too much to, to be handled on the, on the loop road. And so the, the BLM out in Red Rock Canyon has to close it uh, for, for good reason. They just, they just have no choice. So, um, so, so we, we, we have it, there's a tremendous demand for, for more outdoor recreation. Communities of color I just learned this, are three times more likely than white communities to live in nature-deprived areas. And I think this is, with, this is a subtle example of the systemic racial inequities that we're all learning about and becoming more sensitive to in our own culture. Uh, and um, the Great Unconformity Rainbow Gardens area is a fantastic opportunity for outdoor recreation accessible to the northeast quadrant of Las Vegas Valley, which tends to have a higher percentage of, of, of color, of communities of color. Um, and, and obviously there's some, some very beautiful houses there and, and uh, it's a diverse community, but, but uh, there's a, a, an opportunity to provide uh, a recreation opportunities to folks to, to whom Getting for whom getting to Red Rock Canyon, for example, or or uh, Sloan Canyon is not a viable option. This beautiful area is being ravaged by vandalism, graffiti, and other nefarious activities that BLM law enforcement officers are unable to control. I want to hear put in. I want to at this time put in a a very positive shout out um, to uh, Steph remember her last, Clark, Steph Clark, who's the BLM um, law enforcement chief. Steph has done wonderful things, and I just applaud how aggressive and enthusiastic she's been um, working on cleanups out in the in Great Unconformity. So, so the, the BLM folks, I think, are doing everything they can based on what they have available in terms of funding and staff. They just don't have enough funding and staff to, to get the job done as, as it really needs to be done. Um, here's just an example of the graffiti that, was, that um, came along with the original um, vandalism back in the, in the late 90s. Here's some, some modern graffiti that's, that's still there. This is a little canyon that's one of my secret little places um, over on the, on the west face of Frencher Mountain where my grad student and I measured our, our, our section, our, measured our stratigraphy of the Frencher Mountain Dolestone um, 20 years ago, I was back in there um, just just a few months ago, and and it and I cried almost because of the because of the of the graffiti. And so this is the kind of thing that that this area is being subjected to. 
And it's, it's just a crime. It's just a, just a crime to have this beautiful, geologically fantastic area um, ravaged in this way. So creating a, a designated national recreation area with a, with, visit, with a visitor contact station and increased presence of respectful visitors and law enforcement will enhance Southern Nevada's reputation as a mecca for outdoor recreation. And it'll bring in people who will want to see it. Um, the, I, I already showed you a picture of, of folks from China and many other countries who came to, to look for trilobites there. Every year, I have a colleague from Norway uh, who brings his students over from Norway. Um, and one of the places we go is the Great Unconformity at French Rim Mountain. So it's an international magnet for, for visitors. And that can be enhanced um, by making it a, a decent place to go where you don't have to step across broken glass. Uh, and and it's, it's got some, uh, some interpretation, a visitor contact station where people can learn about the geology. Um, the, the, the area is already federal land. So there's, there's, it's managed by the Department of Interior, by the BLM. So there's no complicating land ownership issues. It's not, it's not like, like a lot of other, other areas that, that we've worked on um, that, that had, to, you know, had to negotiate ownership issues and so on. Um, so it's, it, it would not be a difficult thing administratively to create a national, national uh, recreation area here. So I'll, I'll end um, with, with these two images, one being what I think, in spite of the best efforts of BLM folks to put up new interpretive signs, and I'm all for it, and I'm going to work with them and do everything I can to make that successful, I just have 25 years of bad experience with vandalism out there. And unless we take a more aggressive role, um, and uh, hopefully we've learned something in the last 25 years in how you protect these kinds of, of lands, with whether it be with surveillance cameras or, or what, um, there's new technology that we can put to use. So rather than promoting, rather than continuing this, this pattern that we've seen as represented in the lower left image, I would rather see the outcome be more like we see in the upper right where the area is beautiful. It's, it's visited by respectful visitors and it's patrolled by uh, a, a reasonable contingent of law enforcement folks and, and we can be proud of it. So that's, that's my pitch and that's my geology and, I, and it's been a pleasure to talk to you all and I hope we can have some, uh, some, some questions and, and discussion. Yeah. Uh Feel free to uh, unmute yourselves and uh, ask any questions if you have any questions, please. Well, this is John Hyatt, and I have a comment. Um, there's another area that receives the same sort of vandalism, and that's the Sunrise Trailhead out there on the east side of the Wetlands Park. And the park has spent an awful lot of money and effort to try and protect that area. And it's almost impossible unless you have law enforcement there 24 hours a day. And the bad things happen at night, typically. There yeah. People come there to drink and shoot and do lots of bad things. And I think that to solve this problem, we actually need to look not necessarily at trying to harden and protect those areas, but to provide alternative areas for recreation and people to gather and interact away from there, but within those neighborhoods that don't have any parks and don't have much in the way of formal recreation sites in on the east side of the valley where um, incomes are lower and um, a lot of people are unhappy over there. And I think that is a, something that has to be addressed. And it's not something that can be done overnight, um, but it's going to involve actually working with the people in those communities and seeing if they are willing to participate in the protection of those sites and 
what they think would be helpful to their communities to provide alternative areas for people to um, dissipate their energies. Right, good, thank you, John, I, I, it's a great point. I'll also uh, be refreshing uh, the live stream over at Facebook. So uh, if you have any questions, you can also type it in into Facebook. I'll be monitoring those. And we'll keep the floor open for about another five minutes or so, 10 minutes uh, for questions. Um, like I said, chime in, um, open your mic uh, or type it into the chat. Well, I'll make another comment, and that is that the county is now thinking about extending Hollywood Boulevard to the south, which would create, and all the way across the wash and over to Henderson, and they're looking at potentially as many as 40,000 cars a day on that road within two years of construction. So that will bring a huge number, increased number of people to that area. Um, how many of those people would ever get out of their cars and do anything, I don't know. but um it it will change that entire area on um the west side of frenchman mountain when that happens if it happens yeah, yeah. there's also as, as you might know the uh the the do the, the, the ndot folks are are looking at that west side of frenchman mountain as one option as a as an i-11 corridor. I, I doubt that they would choose that option. I think it would be more expensive than, than the others, but, but that would also certainly have an effect on the, the, the neighborhoods in, uh, on the west side of French Mountain. Actually, my interaction with them when they went through the previous iteration of looking on the I-11 corridor was to run it on the east side of Frenchman Mountain through the National Park Service area. And I I think that that was probably a non-starter, but um, the opposition to putting it through on the west side of Frenchman Mountain will bring out a huge number of people in opposition. Right. Okay, good, good point. And um, uh, Gene, uh, the presentation is live on Facebook. Uh, it's also recording, uh, so what I'll do is tomorrow I'll get it uploaded on uh, the Friends of Nevada Wilderness's YouTube page. Um, there's a question in the chat from Jeff. Uh, he says, can you speak about other threats to the area, such as expanding Lake Las Vegas power lines, uh, buildings going up the mountain, and as uh, John just mentioned, uh, I-11 corridor, which we just covered. So, uh, any other threats? Um, I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not too concerned about threats of buildings going higher up on the mountain. Most, I, and, and I might be a little naive on this, I think most of the private land that, that is developable or could, or could be, uh, to be converted from BLM to private land. I, I think that's already been developed, so I'm not too worried about that, but, but may, maybe I just don't have my finger on the pulse of that particular project. Um, so I don't think, I forget what the, what the, other, what the other issue was that he mentioned, Charlene. Uh, power lines? Oh, power lines, yeah, there are. That's a, that's a good point, actually. There is a power line. There is a, a utility corridor that goes through Rainbow Gardens, and that's that's a that's a done deal. I mean, there's no there's no getting around that. There's already a power line that goes through Rainbow Gardens. You might have seen in the background of my photographs of uh, of the Red Needle and and Thumb Pinnacle um, power line. So th they're there already, and it could they they're in, in, it's conceivable that in the future those could be expanded. Those will those will remain in a, in a very tightly constrained corridor. So they're not, gonna, they're not gonna be expanding, I don't think, outside of that corridor, but certainly there could be additional power lines and, and perhaps other utilities going through that corridor. And that's just something 
something that uh, I think is, is going to be there. There's, there's utility lines are a problem in that region because the Park Service obviously doesn't want utility lines going through Grand Canyon or Lake Mead. Um, and so there's not very many places that utilities can come through our, our backyard on the east side. And so that utility corridor is, is going to be, uh, it's going to be there for the long term. So um, that's just the way it is. And I've, I've just, I've learned to live with that and not, not lose any sleep over that and try to focus on other things. Hi, um, I have a question or comment regarding essentially trash. I mean, there's just a huge amount of trash that's accumulated out there and in particular broken glass. I mean, are there ways or would there be value in having the public or having us try to mobilize to try to clean some of that up? And would that help in terms of the um, management and people's view of the area going forward? Sure, sure. And, and that's great. Great point, Jenny. And, and that has been it has been done. So CAM, the Citizens for Active Management, is is the uh, is the protector of that highway, the, the steward of the highway. And we organize cleanups. BLM has organized cleanups. Get Outdoors Nevada has organized cleanups. So the last one that I know of was last the day after Thanksgiving last fall. And, and then with the, the COVID-19 issues being what they are, there hasn't been anything um, since then that I'm aware of. But yeah, absolutely. I think that the cleanups accomplish a couple things. They, they um, help clean up the area. And, and secondly, they, they get people involved. The people that were out there uh, on uh, the day after Thanksgiving last fall, um, we're all having a great time. They spent their morning, Friday morning out there and chatting with each other and they felt like they were doing something. And so I think, I think uh, cleanups are, are great and, and uh, we should do more of them. Um, it's not the, the long-term solution. It seems like the bottle throwers and the trash dumpers uh, are always going to be one one step ahead of us, um, but so it's it. But that's certainly one one part of the process, and and also as John Hyatt mentioned, it, working with the local community and getting them involved as much as possible is important. Not so easy, but it's important. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there actually was a uh, cleanup out there uh, last week, so. Um, okay. Uh, looks like Avanzamos LV and a group we work with called Litter Free LV uh, was out there last Tuesday. Okay, great. And, um, but yeah, just as you were saying, uh, Dr. Roland, uh, we do need, um, you know, kind of um, getting, getting a designation would bring more um, uh, recreationists in there to um, kind of hold that example. Uh, as well as the level of law enforcement as well. Um, you know, it's kind of like um, areas like this, you know, people kind of go out there and feel like no one's watching. Uh, right. So they behave a little bit differently compared to, uh, you know, a place like like Red Rock with a, a, a feed gate and a visitor center. So. All right. Um, question from Jim Lane, is there a major solar plant slated to be constructed again adjacent to Valley of Fire? There is. I, I, it's not. It's not my focus. So I, I don't. I haven't focused on that. That that major solar farm. It's. It's as I understand it, adjacent to the road into Valley of Fire. So it's not. It's not right next to the state park, but it's on the road. It's adjacent to the road next to the park. That's 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 an, a topic that I don't have any special knowledge of, so I, I I can't I can't comment any more on that. But yes, as far as I understand, that's being planned. Yeah, and definitely will uh, you know as that uh, you know materializes or not, you will hear it. Uh, from our social media channels if there's anything uh, that the public needs to do to stop that for sure. Uh, John asks, have you met the volunteer caretaker? He, he goes every day to walk and pick up trash. I guess yes, I, I can't remember his name. 
but I've met him. I've been out there early in the morning a few times, and uh, you're absolutely right. There's a, a local man who I wish I knew his name. I, I did t chat with him, and he told me his name, but I don't remember, uh, who goes out there every morning, walks, walks up the road, and, and picks up trash. And it's just, it's just wonderful. So that's right. I met him. Yeah, that's definitely awesome. Um, yeah, so if you guys don't have any other questions, definitely let you guys go for the evening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roland. Is there a um, petition or anything like that where we can sign on? Or you know, that's a great question. I don't, I don't have. Um, Helen Mortensen and I have been circulating a kind of a sheet to get to get names and email addresses of people so that once we once we have a strategy uh, and we need to mobilize the, the forces to get letters of support and that sort of thing um, we've been we've been doing that I, I don't have anything ready but but I what I would do I guess is when the time comes contact you Shailen and and uh, ask for support from the from the Friends of Nevada Wilderness. Yeah, definitely. We'll definitely uh, get that out there. So uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we definitely need more uh, national recreational areas uh, in uh, the Vegas Valley. Uh, so uh, let's try to try to get uh, this area dedicated uh, the next few years or so. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve, this yeah. is Nick. Hi. Great job. Thank you. Can Nick. you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. So what recommendations do you have for the public to try to achieve this level of protective status? What should we do? What should the public do to make it happen? Oh, well, that's a great, great question. Um, I had hoped by now to have had a good discussion with, with Congressman Stephen Horsford, his district that we're talking about. And so he's obviously a key player here because of this COVID-19 problem. I haven't done that. So I, I need to talk to Congressman Horsford. Um, Helen and I have had conversations with, with the people on the, on the, the county board, um, Marilyn, Marilyn Kirkpatrick and, and uh, what's his name? Jackson Joe. Yeah, I can't, sorry, I can't remember. The, but it's Marilyn Kirkpatrick's district. Um, so we, we, talked, we talked about these things with her um, and with Tick Sager, Sager Bloom, that's, that's the name I couldn't think of. So um, I would say, I, I, I'm sorry to have to say that there's nothing that I can ask you to do right now, but probably it's going to be after the election um, when hopefully we have a, a contingent of, of elected officials nationwide and statewide who are receptive to, to working with us on these kinds of issues. And I'm certainly uh, open to creative ideas. I think John Hyatt's comments were, were right on right on target. So we need to we need creative ideas, and and we need the elected officials to to buy in. And and I and I just need to talk to Congressman Horsford and make sure he he's on board with this, which I haven't had a chance to do yet. So sit tight, Nate, Nick, and and uh, I'll let you know when it's time for for action. Thanks for asking. Sure. All right. Well, we'll be sitting tight. And um, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Roland, for your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up uh, on Facebook as well as uh, here on Zoom. And uh, you guys enjoy the rest of your evenings. Okay. Thanks, Charlene. All right. You're welcome. See you guys.